Otter, and now we have the Pledge of Allegiance from Lynn Marie De Vincent. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Lynn. Let's go ahead and do our roll call. Um, and Gay. Council Member Hundley. Here. Council Member Cook. Here. Council Member Agramonte. Here. Council Member Edwards. Yes. Mayor Gallion. Present. Well, with that, um, I'll go ahead and give the report out on closed session. We gave uh, direction to staff. Um, next on the agenda is our comments from the public. At this time, members of the public may comment on any item not appearing on the agenda. It is recommended that you keep your comments to three minutes or less. Under state law, matters presented under this item cannot be discussed or acted upon by the City Council at this time. For items appearing on the agenda, the public will be invited to make comments at the time the item comes before council consideration. Upon being acknowledged by the mayor, please step to the podium and speak into the microphone. Begin by stating and spelling your name. And I believe uh, we have the Honorable uh, Brown here, Mayor Brown. <laughs> A good name in politics. Ken Brown, B-R-O-W-N, resident of the city of Sonoma. So it's my, my wish and my desire to be an example. I've served on the city council. Now I'm a proud member of the Community Services and Environment Commission. I'm on the Library Advisory Board. I'm a staunch ally of Friends of the Library. I'm on the hospital round table. I know everyone here. I know each of you. I know the issues. I want to just take a moment and thank Madeline and Gary for their hard work on our pool event this past Saturday. It was awesome. And it was, it's an example of teamwork and working together. So it's my wish and my prayer that we work together for the city of Sonoma. I know that we can do it. And so blessings on each and every one of you, all of you, here in the audience. We deserve these blessings, and it's a pleasure to give them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. My name is Ann Ray, spelled W-R-A-Y, and I'm here as part of the housing group of Sonoma United Methodist Church. We've been coming to these meetings since August. It's now the end of the year, and the housing situation is even more dire because it is winter, and the homeless are struggling with the cold, wet conditions. Have you read the article in the no November-December 2015 issue of Valley of the Moon magazine on being homeless in Sonoma Valley? The article focuses on the homeless community that lives under the bridge on Leveroni Road. It is shocking and eye-opening. This community has so many needs, from food and shelter, medical and mental health care, addiction services, jobs, education, and more. How can we, in this extremely affluent community, allow our brothers and sisters to become so marginalized by our society? I know the county recently did a large study on the housing homeless issue and presented its report here in one of your meetings. But how long can we wait for any action from that report to trickle down to actually helping people who are in such desperate need right now? I'm asking this council to step up to the plate now and do the right thing, whatever is in, within the bounds of your authority as a city council of Sonoma. Several of your council members have expressed interest in taking up housing uh, in the new year. I'm asking you to place this item on your next agenda and on the agenda of every meeting following until some solutions to the housing crisis are reached. One of the first issues should be to declare a housing emergency. 
which Portland, Seattle, Alameda, Los Angeles, and the state of Hawaii have done. This declaration could possibly open up some funds from the county, state, or federal government to help with solutions to the housing crisis. We need to be thinking creatively about what we can do immediately to help people and what will be needed longer term to solve the many housing problems in Sonoma. Certainly funds will be needed, and if declaring a housing state of emergency will help, then that should be a first step. Another important first step would be to find some city-owned property that is safe and has some basic utilities to set up a tent city for the homeless. Other cities, such as Seattle, have done just that, and their plans could be a model for Sonoma. I am really afraid for the Maxwell Park community, homeless community, that lives down around the creek. If the El Nino rains come as predicted, those people will be in real danger. If the creek rises very fast, they may not be warned in time to get out. Please establish a safe place for them now, before someone is hurt or loses a life. I was listening to the rain falling last night and was thinking about the people with no you, shelter Anne. who are out in the storm. If that was my friend, my sister, my child out there, I would be devastated. Thank you, Anne. All right. <clears throat> Michelle Ritchie, R-I-C-H-E-Y, um, resident of Sonoma County. And I brought magazines for all of you guys. It's uh, amazing, and kudos to David Bowling. He's dedicated this magazine to holidays in the homeless. Um, it has several great articles, one about the uh, affordable house uh, apartments in Fetters, but it also says affordable apartments for 60 new households are just a drop in the bucket. Um, it goes on, like I said, there's like several articles. Uh, and with facts and figures and percentages, it's wonderful. Uh, one of the things I do want to read is describing the obstacles to obtaining housing. 67% of our homeless in Sonoma said they just couldn't afford the new rent. <clears throat> and another interesting article is about the Sonoma Developmental Center. And they're kind of comparing, they're, they're trying to drive these people out, which is horrible because they can't afford to be there anymore. They're not self-sustaining. And neither was the Presidio in San Francisco until they opened it up for housing. So, I mean, that could be a solution. And I know you guys are tired of us coming up saying we have a problem and offering no solutions. So, you know, it's possible we could maybe do something like that one final thought and I've been to many benefits given for the boys and girls club and pets lifeline over the 30 years I've lived here and God bless the generous spirit of our town I have seen millions of dollars uh, raised for them they're very incredibly important agencies but many of the animals are there because people had to abandon them because they got evicted or displaced. And the kids that go to the Boys and Girls Club, they're there largely because none of the adults in their household are there. They're working sometimes one or two or three jobs. So, so they can pay the ever-increasing rents. And it seems to me like we're treating the symptoms and we're ignoring the disease that's spawning the symptoms. So I think we need to get more affordable housing in Sonoma. I think we need it soon. Thank you for your time. Where Thank do you, I Michelle. Get magazines too. I have a whole stack of them. <laughs> Uh, my name is Frank Wines, W-I-N-D-E-S. I live on Denmark Street, and I, too, am a member of the Methodist Church Social Action Group, where we have been working for the last several months on affordable housing for the folks that work here. 
There's some good attention starting now on homeless, many of whom are working here but can't afford the rent with their incomes. There are about 30 to 40 people at Maxwell Park every night. It varies quite a bit. And there are even more under the bridges, in their cars, couch surfing. They all need support with services, but they need to be allowed to stay where they are without harassment until we can find a place for them to be. But there's a much larger set of people who are on the edge. They're on the verge of being forced out of their homes by the increasing rents. And I have to ask myself, what are we going to do with a few hundred homeless families? It's a much more difficult problem to deal with. We need a tent village right now, right here in Sonoma Valley. FEMA has tents, we should be able to get them somehow. And then we need a place that we can have a big cluster of affordable micro houses after we get the tents in. It's more permanent. This is going to be a multi-stage, long-term effort, and it's going to cost some real bucks. With the cold weather upon us, we need act to act immediately. That is why we are asking for a declaration of housing emergency, but it has to be written in such a way that we have a chance of getting state or federal funds to help us cover the cost. Sonoma City created a very good housing element, I think, that covers the city and its entire uh, catchment area in the county. This needs a joint effort by the city and the county to make anything happen. Implementing that plan is going to require a lot more housing at all economic levels. But normal economics uh, cannot uh, cover the affordable housing at the wages that we can afford in this town. What we're going to need uh, is reinstatement of the uh, redevelopment funding, but we'll probably also need a, a housing trust because affordable housing can only be built with capital that does not require a, a return on investment. It's a very tough thing. Some of you have stated that you want to make housing a key project in the new year. Uh, there's much to do. We'd like to help. Please, I beg you, get us on your next agenda. Thank you very much, Frank. Lynn Marie De Vincent, 65 Guadalajara, Mayor Galleon and Council Members, Mr. Walters, Ms. Giovanato, Mr. Goodison, and Ms. Johan. Um, as a representative of the Sonoma Manufactured Homeowners Alliance and a spokesperson for the Tripart Committee, I would like to express our deep appreciation for your time, efforts, and patience during these past months um, and for some of you years um, on the work for the City of Sonoma's Space Rent Protection Ordinance. Those of us in these senior communities as well as the families in these affordable homes are optimistic about our future here, that we will be able to remain here and age in our own homes with the support of our friends and neighbors, the community and the City of Sonoma. We realize there's more work to do in 2016, but we are committed to completing this revision project, and we look forward to a successful outcome for the, all of those involved. I would like to add my blessings to you and your families and everyone. Thank you again. Thank you, Lynn. Gary Hermes, 12 Ramon Street in Sonoma, and you can relax, I'm also here to thank you. Thank the uh, council and the staff. Um, you have just such a tough job. Um, it's a 19th century village and you're trying to adapt it to 21st century needs. It's just not easy and there are so many of us, 10,000 of us, with 10,000 different ideas on how to do that. And you have to listen to each of us and make some tough, very tough decisions. So I really appreciate uh, all of you, I love this town because of you, and um, 
I just so appreciate that you are willing to listen to all of our needs and so patiently and to do the work that you do. So I wish you happy holidays and thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Good evening. Mario Castillo, 431 Kelsey Court in Alvarado. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm, I'm the ghost of the past. I came here in 1990. I was, um, I was my son's age. My son is over there. Alex, you want to stand up? So that, that's, how, that's how young I was when I came here. And um, I, the first, my first house where I, where I lived was uh, off of uh, Madrone Road uh, on that uh, ranch property. There was about 40, 40 of us there. Mm -hmm. And I remember that back then when they were trying to, uh, to create La Luz, and then there was also an effort to create housing for vineyard workers. And I was Googling the other day in regards to housing, and then there was an interesting article where, where vineyard work, vineyards actually argue that they, they, didn't, they were not responsible for providing housing for the vineyard, for the vineyard workers. And I guess that's, that's, that if you ask around, that's still probably the, 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 the argument, right? So I didn't go anywhere. I stayed here. And then now I'm here, and I have a family here too. And I'm still struggling to, to find a house. I rent. And there is a lot, a lot of families who are still finding themselves in the same situation as me. Uh, the other day I was also thinking, and then I, you know, we told Susan Gorin that, that uh, rent control, a rent stabilization would be a great deal, a great thing. And she goes, well, I don't know if that will really benefit people because it's, it, that only applies to houses, uh, buildings that were, were constructed uh, before 1995. And I began thinking, well, I, I, arrived, I, arrived here, I arrived here in 1990 and I haven't really seen a lot of buildings being built uh, after that. Most of the, of the buildings where, where, the, where, where, the fa where the people that I work with uh, live, you know, such as you know, in Boy's Hot Spring, Valley of the Moon, Mission Terrence, all those, all those, uh, all those buildings were, were built before 1995, so that would that would definitely benef ben ben uh, benefit a lot of the families. Also, you know, there's been a few hotels, very nice hotels here in town, that have been built, but I haven't seen a lot of housing, you know, that that it's that it's uh, available for, for for the people who live here. So I, I don't know, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, there's still, I feel I, I I you know I still keep on thinking that that. You know, I don't know how much longer I, I will I will be able to, to afford to live here, but I will still you know I will still come back and then and then remind people that you know that it's been a long it's been long and then affordable housing hasn't been provided for the people that that do the the work for 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 the city of Sonoma, and that's that's a shame. So thank you, and have a great Christmas. Thank you, Mario. Hi, my name is Fred Olibach at 19550 8th Street East, and I would like to stand in, in solidarity with the people who have come up here and spoken about affordable housing, and it's an issue that I myself have been very interested in and studied and looking into it, and I, and I realize that this is a large nationwide systemic issue that doesn't just apply to Sonoma itself, though Sonoma may, you know, manifest the the uh, affordability issue in a more extreme way. This is a national issue that came about as a result of the subprime bubble popping, people going into foreclosure, going underwater, the housing being bought at by real estate speculators, and then running up the, the rents because it's a cornering of the market by people who can pay that money. And so it's, uh, and then people buying homes specifically for vacation rentals because of the huge returns they can get in a town like this for the agro tourism. So I know that it's a it's a large systemic issue, and I recently learned that Jerry Brown has vetoed every possible source of affordable housing fund at the state level since he's been the governor, which I was kind of shocked at. And the most recent veto that he did took away um, 
uh, quite a few million dollars, I think it was a hundred million dollars that could have been shared to municipalities in the state, plus it, it took away access to federal money that would have been a billion dollars to state housing. And uh, so I think that, you know, part of the trouble is, is for what you might be able to do is that, you know, you're hamstrung by lack of funds. The redevelopment agency went under when, they ha when the subprime bubble popped. That's when the education went under, state parks went under. So California has got some big systemic troubles. And so here you are at the city council fielding people's legitimate ethical complaints about how the lower portions of our society are being treated amidst so much wealth and you know you're you're in a position well what are you going to do about it and so personally if i was on the city council i would want to at least make a symbolic you know statement on that but in terms of practical suggestions tonight i could maybe suggest that uh that the city increase its own density bonus for very low and low income housing or that you change the inclusionary principle to make it 30 percent rather than 20 percent or raise the impact fees some things that you could actually do from here that uh you know would address systemic problems that are really beyond your control but you would be able to do something so thanks very much Thank you very much, Fred. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? If not, I will close public comment, bring it back to uh, council, and I'm just going to ask, are there any meeting dedications? Seeing none, um, we'll go to presentations, of which none are scheduled. That leads us to the uh, consent calendar. So all items listed on the consent calendar are considered to be routine, and will be acted upon by a single motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless members of the council, staff, or public request specific items to be removed for separate action. At this time, the council may decide to change the order of the agenda. Council, do you have any comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll open this up to the public. Comments on the consent calendar? Please step forward. Seeing none, I'll close it, bring it back to council, looking for a motion. Madeline? Uh, I'd like to move approval on 4A, 4B, and 4C. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Um, let's go ahead and have roll call. Member Hundley? Aye. Council Member Cook? Aye. Council Member Agramonte? Aye. Council Member Edwards? Yes. Mayor Gallion? Aye. So that concludes. We have passed the consent agenda with all items uh, for A, B, and C. Uh, we'll move on to um, consent uh, calendar agenda order for the city council as successor agency. Um, does anyone have any questions about this? All right. We'll move for public comment. Any comments from the public on this? Seeing none, we'll close. Looking for a motion. I'd like to make a motion on the consent counter for the city council as a successor agency, item 5A. Second? I'll second that. Okay, we have a we have a motion and we have a second. Roll call, please. Council Member Hundley? Aye. Council Member Cook? Aye. Council Member Agramonte? Aye. Council Member Edwards? Yes. Mayor Gallion? Yes. So we have just gone ahead and approved the consent calendar agenda order for the city council as successor agency. Um, next will be any public hearings, of which we have none scheduled. That will move us on to the regular calendar of the City Council. So we are before us in item 7A. And this is discussion, consideration, and possible action selecting the 2016 City of Sonoma a call day. Um, Carol, I think you open this up. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mayor Galley and members of the City Council. Pursuant to the Alcalde selection policy, the nominating committee met on November 28th and reviewed nominations received in response to our newspaper ad. The committee also was provided a list of nominees from prior years. The nominating committee was comprised of our former Mayor Cook, current and immediate past Alcalde Suzanne Brangham and Les and Judy Vazdez, and our current Alcaldessa Marcy Waldron, along with myself, city manager. 
The committee members reviewed new nominations submitted this year along with the list of the pre previous nominees. And just to review, as stated in the policy, the all call day nominees should embody several of uh, the criteria, which includes a broad spectrum of voluntary community service to Sonoma Valley, service in a leadership role in at least one nonprofit organization, sp has spearheaded at least one community serving project without compensation, is well known for consistent behind the scenes good deeds does not seek public accolades or recognition for work done, and adheres to a high standard of moral and ethical values. So in accordance with the All Call Day selection policy, the committee forwarded candidates for Mayor Gallion's consideration. And tonight, our mayor will announce her nominee for the 2016 All Call Day or All Call Dessa. Mayor Gallion. <laughs> Thank you very much. And that's kind of like a drum roll there. Um, no pressure on this particular process, I might add. Um, uh, one of the things that um, I felt necessary was to actually go and actually talk with the members of the uh, committee themselves. I, it was a little awkward having um, a decision um, being vetted to me without having been part of the process. and. Um, I hope to introduce um, on an agenda item of my own, should the council decide to take it up um, next year, that maybe perhaps we uh, change the timing of this particular um, selection to January so that the current mayor can actually be part of it. Um, there's a lot that we do in the month of December for committees and restructuring, and, and we need to tie off some of our important issues before the year ends. And I think that um, I would never want this to be anything less than a full vetting for this position, since it is so um, important to the city of Sonoma. Um, I was reading back in the annals because, again, although this is the second time I have selected an Acaldi, um, I wanted to go back into history. I take very much to heart what the city has gone ahead and established as their goals for this year. And part of what we're looking for in our city character is a place, um, creating a sense of place and maintaining and strengthening our historic values. So. When I went about this this particular year, I looked back and in 1975, the city of Sonoma decided once again to find the town's most useful citizen and bestow upon them the title Honorary Ecalde. August Pinelli, the first to be honored, began his year January 1, 1976. The council had voted for an honorary Ecalde every year since. The honoree is given a gold-headed cane as a symbol um, of the honor and appears in parades and grand openings. So to me, I just wanted to go back in history and really um, start that tradition again and kind of renew because this is what we've all committed to as council members up here. So this is kind of a long drum roll into who this person is. And with that, I would like to go ahead and announce uh, my candidate that meets the Voluntary Community Service to Sonoma Valley, service in a leadership role in a nonprofit organization, spearheaded community serving project without compensation, is well known for consistent behind the scene good deeds. I have witnessed a few of these. Does not speak, uh, does not seek pug public accolades or recognition for his work done and adheres to a high standard of moral and ethical values. My choice is Patrick Garcia. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> now, at this point, I believe we go to public comment. Anyone wishing to speak on this particular item, please step forward. Let me do this. I want to thank all of you. I know each and every one of you. And uh, I didn't say where I lived. I lived in 817 Oregon Street, including our city mayor. I talked to each of you in casual, 
periods of time just to really open up my heart to what I have here. And when I discovered some of the most incredible things in my life here, it really just shook me. For example, I discovered that there was never an alcalde from the California system of California. Those were the actual founders of California. Then I discovered that this man by the name of General Vallejo happens to be a second cousin of mine five generations back. That, again, just took me beyond what I would possibly think about. And here I am today living in this incredible town and with all my sons and my family here. They have treated this town also with great respect. Diego Garcia, uh, many people know him, and my other sons too, who are very talented human beings. And here I am again. I want to really be precious and give my whole life to this wonderful town that we have called Sonoma. And I couldn't find a better town. Everywhere I go in this country, and in Mexico and other countries, I promote Sonoma, and people love it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Now the process is to speak on this. The council still comes okay. back. They okay. vote, and they give their comments as well. So okay. if we have anyone else who wishes to speak on this, please step forward. All right. Seeing none, I will close the public comment section and open it for council. Okay. David. Well, I guess I'll start. Um, being mayor and knowing what it means to uh, select an Acalde or a, a Caldessa is um, one of your first orders of business, and I want to support Mayor Gallion. Um, I know Patrick Garcia personally and have seen all the good work you've done, so um, hopefully congratulations will be in order, and I will be making a motion um, to accept the ratification of the nomination of Patrick Garcia as the Acalde. Uh, Council Member Hudley. I will second that nomination. And uh, Patrick Garcia was one of the first people I met when I moved to town because I used to spend a lot of time at Barking Dog, where both you and one of your sons did. Um, and I know that you've done a lot for the city with sister cities and just with the uh, cultural history that we have here. And I think that that's something that I would like to focus on celebrating. And I think that you're the, the perfect person to have this year that we can really look at some of these elements of the city that we haven't focused on yet. So I support this nomination. All right. Um, Council Member Edwards. Oh, uh, acting in the Bear Flag Revolt with Patrick has been uh, exciting over the last 10 or 12 years. Um, and I actually get to see Patrick almost every day um, in front of the Basque um, these days. And I'm uh, very pleased to have you as our, uh, it sounds like we have a majority. Um, as our new alcalde. So, you know, I invite you to Rotary someday as well. Now, um, Mayor Pro Tem, I'm sure you're ready to. Well, I will tell you, uh, Mr. Garcia, of course, when you're one of the most charming men I've met, so obviously this might have been part of uh, a requirement. So I'm just really proud to be part of this. Thank you. And um, before we go ahead and take the vote, I just wanted to say that. Um, your work, uh, especially in the state parts, historical component, but your years back in the 70s when um, August Pinelli was taking his particular um, due as the honorary Acaldi, you were very busy and very active, making so much headway in um, labor, sweat, equity, properties, proposals. You've done... Um, an incredible amount of outreach uh, for Spanish-speaking individuals in our community. Um, I can tell you that um, I, I don't really want to know what your grade was in the Certified Tourist Ambassador because you probably aced every question on this um, just because you know it and you have been living this history. But I can't think of a finer representative um, for Sonoma Valley but specifically because you are our own and living in the city of Sonoma. 
I am very happy to make this this um, nomination. And uh, it sounds to me like we need a roll call vote, make it final, and um, then we'll ask you if you accept. <laughs> All right. Councilmember Hundley? Aye. Councilmember Cook? Aye. Councilmember Agramonte? Aye. Councilmember Edwards? Yes. Mayor Gallion? Yes. Now, if you would step to the podium, I'd like to ask you the question. Normally, I'd be ringing my phone right now. <laughs> Go ahead. So, this is to inform you that the council has decided that you will be our 2016 a call day for the city of Sonoma. Will you accept the position? Yes. Thank you. Si. Thank you. <laughs> In <All> español. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Thank you kindly. Appreciate that. <sighs> we all ready to continue on? Okay. Let's go ahead and go further. Uh, congratulations and thank you. Um, we'll go on to discussion, consideration, and possible direction to staff concerning options for the use of the Masonavi Cottage. And I believe, uh, David, you will be taking this on. Thank you, Mayor Gellion, members of the City Council. First, some background on the property. In 1991, Henry Masonave bequeathed to the city properties located at 289 and 291 First Street East, uh, two separate parcels, uh, each developed, uh, one with a main residence, one with a smaller cottage. Now, the city did not immediately take possession of those properties because under the terms of Mr. Masonave's will, he gave a life estate in those properties to a friend of his who then moved out of state and rented them out. Um, so it was actually several years later that the city took formal possession of the properties after his friend died. And um, when that occurred, uh, the tenants within those um, properties uh, were required to leave in essence and the city took stock of what it had. And what it had uh, at that point was kind of a mess because there was, had been no maintenance conducted on either building for many, many years. And unfortunately, the tenants who occupied those buildings uh, did not do any kind of justice to them. And to the contrary, they, they left them behind in a very poor condition, um, which I can attest to having been there inspecting them. Uh, at the first time they, they, they came into the city. So the immediate need was to secure those properties and uh, in that regard, the main residence was boarded up. The city made some immediate improvements and clean up to the cottage, which was then rented out to a city park employee so that it could be in essence a caretaker's cottage. Um, so once those um, items had been accomplished, the city turned its attention to actually making progress in terms of bringing the main residents up to speed and invited proposals and ultimately partnered with the League for Historic Preservation to do a complete restoration of the main residence. That project took many years to complete, I think at a cost of more than $600,000, um, of which the city contributed half of that amount and um, that project was completed successfully. The league is there today in a long-term lease. Um, but in the meantime, the city determined that it could not legally rent out the cottage um, because it was found uh, by our council that that was actually in violation of the terms of the bequest. It was not one of the items allowed for in the bequest. The bequest limits the Masonave property to uses as a memorial park or museum. So it's not, it wasn't an open-ended gift. Uh, so um, that park employee left the residence and it has been the cottage and it has been um, vacant ever since. And the city has spent many years um, trying to figure out what to do with this property. In 2011, in 2011 the city was Council was um, giving serious consideration to having the cottage demolished. A um, 
referral was made to the Design Review Commission. Uh, the commission recommended against demolition, asked that the council consider other options. And so the council went out to the community. Uh, the city essentially circulated a request for proposals inviting ideas for making use of the cottage and bringing it up to um, you know, some level of code compliance. Through that process, one proposal was received from a local group uh, called Benchmark Hoover in which they proposed to renovate the cottage at an anticipated cost of approximately $150,000 and use it as a vacation rental under a 20-year lease with the city. Um, the city evaluated that proposal very carefully. We wanted to make sure that um, it was consistent with the terms of the bequest. It was found to be consistent and that the proceeds of the lease were going to be used uh, at the termination of the lease to um, bring the cottage up to a public level. And so that finding was made. The council signed off on the concept and after an extensive negotiation period, a lease was um, approved by the city council in April of 2015. However, once um, Benchmark Hoover got into the details of developing detailed designs, sorry, that was a redundancy. Once Benchmark Hoover got into the design process and really figured out what it was going to take to bring that cottage up to code, they realized that the improvement expense was going to be significantly greater than, that, than they had anticipated, and they withdrew from the agreement. When the facilities committee received this update uh, in October, the committee directed staff to return to the city council with an updated list of options. And as pointed out in the staff report, one note I'd like to make uh, at this point is, while the lease was in effect, Benchmark Hoover did do some interior demolition removing the kitchen and bathroom facilities. But because those elements did not meet ADA or building code standards, they would, have needed to be, they would need to be removed under any reuse scenario. And so the removal has no significant effect on options for reusing the building. So with the withdrawal of the um, Benchmark Hoover group, staff went back and has um, come to the council with a summary list of four options that we've identified, and there may be others out there, but these are the ones that um, come to mind so far. One is to convert the cottage to storage use. Uh, under this option, the building would be renovated to a relatively minimal level. Um, if the building is used as storage, it doesn't need a kitchen. It doesn't need a bathroom. Those are expensive items to install. Um, once that renovation was complete, uh, the building could be turned over potentially to the League for Historic Preservation as they have a need for archival storage space. Unfortunately, um, due to the dilapidated condition of the building and the need to replace its foundation, the renovation cost is still high. It's estimated by the building official at approximately $414,000. The League for Historic Preservation has stated that they welcome any proposal that would preserve the structure and that they are uh, willing to possibly take on the long-term maintenance of the building if it were converted to storage use, but they've also stated that they do not have the means at this point to contribute to the upfront cost of renovation, which would make it solely the city's responsibility. And I would add that with respect to this option, the council uh, recently received an email from a representative of the Historical Society who's also interested in the storage option. A second alternative would be to demolish the cottage and make use of that area for other park activities. The council could choose this course and doing so would not violate the terms of the bequest um, because as previously, because as we've noted, um, the main structure has been renovated for use as a museum and under this option, the entirety of the property would remain in park use. So all of that's consistent with the bequest. There's cost to this option as well. It's a one-time cost of approximately $65,000 uh, to demolish the cottage. That's not insignificant. It does avoid future building maintenance and upgrade costs, however. If this option were implemented, the land would remain in public ownership and could be devoted to an expansion of park activities of some kind. Um, different ideas have been raised in the past. The local Patonk and Bocce organizations have expressed interest in this area of the property. Several council members um, 
in discussions regarding an allowance for leash dogs on the Montini property have expressed interest in, in finding a site for an additional dog park. And other uses have been raised from time to time, and not necessarily with respect to this particular site, but just in terms of general uh, wishes for park facilities, including a pickleball court and space for community garden plots. So this list isn't intended to really be part of much discussion tonight. I mean, we're not here asking you to choose among these items. Just to point out that if the cottage were demolished, there are, there are other activities to which that area could be put. A third option would be to try to pursue the vacation rental um, option, but with a new partner. In this regard, staff has made some preliminary inquiries to the owners of the vacation rentals adjoining the subject property. Uh, that are to the south of it, and to another local owner operator of vacation rentals who has experience in renovating older buildings. Both declined due to the, due to the, substantial, due to the substantial upfront cost of renovation. And um, just frankly, given what happened with the Benchmark Hoover proposal, it does appear that those costs are quite significant. And in staffs, you really call the viability of this option into question because um, you've got to pay a lot of money up front to renovate that cottage. You've got a, a long payout over 20 years to make that work, and you don't have a, an ownership interest. So we can certainly pursue this further, but we're not optimistic about this uh, concept given uh, the experience with the, the previous proposal. The fourth option that we've identified is uh, to subdivide the property. In previous discussions with the council, the concept was raised of dividing the property off from the Paton courts. Uh, this would create an 11,000 square foot parcel that would encompass the cottage that could be sold for occupancy as a single family residence, perhaps with a conservation easement to ensure that renovations or additions would be made in conformance with um, standards for historic preservation. Under this approach, the cottage and a significant portion of the Masonave parcel would be removed from public ownership. However, the cottage itself would be preserved and the financial responsibility for its restoration would be rem removed from the city. Uh, as discussed uh, in the staff report, in order to implement this option, the bequest would need to be altered <clears throat> at an estimated cost of between fifteen dollars and $25,000 through a process known as uh, equitable deviation. And I don't think that we need to get into the details of that process. It's, it's set forth in the materials that, that you've received. We're happy to answer any questions about it, but suffice it to say that just due to the nature of the bequest and the interest, um, the overall public interest in ensuring that uh, bequests are honored, uh, it's not a simple process to amend a will after the fact. You have to go through a, a fairly lengthy legal process to get that done that involves um, other parties who might have an interest in the, um, in the, in the will. So those are the options that we've identified. I do want to point out that with respect to the demolition option, again, um, that had been referred to the Design Review Commission uh, before the name change. That's why I'm referring to it as the Design Review Commission in this context. Um, at that time, it, the property the, the city did commission an evaluation of the property to determine whether it was historically significant. Uh, we hired a consultant with expertise in that regard who concluded that the property, that the cottage is not historically significant. However, you've also received correspondence today uh, and the council has received this correspondence previously uh, disputing that conclusion. So we're here to um, Hear your discussion and get your direction on this uh, on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, council members, questions? Yes, Council Member Hundley. I have a couple questions. Um, I noticed uh, in the agenda back in 2013, the last discussion, I saw a figure for 700,000 for uh, renovations. Why? Um, what's the huge differential from what was back then and what was what we're talking about today well the seven hundred thousand dollar estimate was for renovating the cottage to a public use standard basically to the same level that the 
main residence was renovated to. So um, if you take it to a higher level in terms of the uses, it's a more expensive um, thing to accomplish. And do you think, so if we wanted to renovate the building to turn it into a museum, do you think that that figure is still pretty similar? Well, every year it seems like building costs go up. We would want to see another um, evaluation. I would not be surprised if the costs went up because um, at this moment in time, in terms of the economy, there's a lot of building activity going on and construction costs are higher than, than they were at the time that that estimate was prepared. So the estimate for the uh, storage use, can you explain the 40% management fee, the last line item? I didn't prepare that, that estimate, and I, I don't know what that fee refers to. I'm, I apologize, but we can certainly get you that information. Okay, because it looks like it has construction subtotal 280, but then at the bottom there's this huge 40% management, so I'm just wondering what that is all about. Um, and when Benchmark Hoover decided or realized that this project was going to be more than they anticipated, um, was there any interest in tr discussing it or trying to work out something? or? I spent a lot of time with Benchmark Hoover on that very question. And um, so there was certainly interest in our part, and there was some interest in their part. But ultimately, they just couldn't make it work. Um, was some of the unexpected expenses, um, was it related to ADA? Or was yes. And would those expenses be different if the building was deemed historical? Not really. Um, the bathroom, I, I, well, first, depending on the use, you may or may not need a bathroom, as we've talked about. But um, for the vacation rental option, you need a bathroom. It needs to be ADA compliant. You need a kitchen. It needs to be ADA compliant. Um, you do get some breaks if the building, if you use the historic building code. But... Um, you don't, you're, you're, there are still many ADA requirements that, that would apply. And my last question for now is, do you know if they had any other political consultants or anybody come out and look at the property or write any reports about it? I'm sorry, any other what type Just of consultant? Any, have, did they have any uh, historical reports made about the building? Oh, did they? No. Yeah. So and we were willing to apply the historic building code standard of the property, that the building doesn't need to necessarily have the state level um, designation to apply the historic building code. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Council Member Edwards. So, David, if you could tell me, um, with the, um, the Hoover Group, um, they did some dismantling. I know I did a walk around the building um, a month or two ago. So they've removed a couple of walls, but also, if I'm not mistaken, the bathroom on the back half of the property is exposed to to the rain at this moment is that correct well i hope that's not correct because um i you know we've been in discussion with parks and i believe that they've secured the building okay so this yeah this was i think six weeks yeah ago. yeah okay thank you um council any other questions uh yes rachel so i know the difference in the city doing projects is we have things like the prevailing wage and other things that um make it more ex expensive, but if, so if a, if a private party were to, I guess you probably would have to speculate, but if a private party wanted to um, renovate it and do something with it and make, or so if a private party wanted to renovate it and turn it to a museum, do you think that the expense would be around the 700 mark that we're looking at or something lower? I think it would be around the 700 mark and one of the issues that we run into with prevailing wage that we were trying to avoid and thought we had a method of avoiding with the Benchmark Hoover proposal, um, with that particular proposal, you know, again, we circulated this request for proposals. We said, here's this property. Here's what the city's willing to do in terms of, um, you know, removing the barn and making one or two other adjustments correcting this electrical condition. You give us your best proposal in terms of what you can do with this property. So we were able to 
at least potentially make the argument that the city is not subsidizing that work. Um, with a museum, and again, I'm just speculating, but um, it, it's hard, it becomes harder to imagine that there wouldn't be some request for city assistance. And as soon as that is granted, um, then prevailing wage is, kicks in. Any other questions? Um, David, I have a question for you. Timing on this. Um, is this a decision that has to be made within a certain time frame, and why would that be? We've brought this forward because of the circumstances surrounding the failure of the lease option. The property can be secured and left as is. Uh, I don't know if indefinitely is the correct word, but um, you know it can stay as is for some time. Okay. Uh, my question was: I wanted to know if it was a matter of urgency that we act. No, um, the property is secured. It can be made more secure if necessary. Um, we don't want it to be a hazard. We don't want it to be an attractive nuisance. That's not good for any of them. That's not good for the city. It's not good for any of our neighbors. But um, it wouldn't be accurate to say, oh, you have to make a decision tonight in terms of where you're going to go with this property. Any decision that you make is going to take further time to sort out and implement. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Council Member Hundley. If we do... Um, decide to demolish it, would it have to go through the same process of going back to design review? And what would happen if they, if the same thing happened the last time? Well, that's not clear to me. I mean, the pro this was referred to design review, and they gave you their recommendation, and the council, I think it is fair to say, took their advice seriously and did a very extensive review of options for that property, and you're still engaged in that process. So I'm not sure it would need to go back to the Design Review Commission, but uh, we'll look at that. Okay, at this point, um, unless there are further questions, I'd like to hear from the public. Um, I would like to ask if you're going to speak on this, would you just queue up in the aisle? Thank you very much. Opening public comment. Uh, Joe Costello, 128 Mission Terrace. And I'm appearing tonight on behalf of the North of the Mission Neighborhood Association. Um, Mayor Gallion, uh, council members and staff. Um, I have received an, uh, a copy of the supplemental report, a very thorough and comprehensive report uh, by the planning director, uh, Mr. Goodison. Um, and he has very graciously uh, circulated a copy of a letter that I asked to be added to the agenda package. And that was from uh, Professor uh, David DeLong of uh, Professor Emeritus from the University of Pennsylvania, who is a resident of Sonoma, who wrote this letter in rebuttal to the consultant uh, hired by uh, staff to do the historical evaluation. And uh, his findings uh, were to the contrary, that this was in fact a historical building for the reasons stated in his letter. Um, from our neighborhood standpoint, the preservation of this historic structure and neighborhood asset is our primary and paramount focus. Um, I personally have always, through this lengthy process, we're going into the fifth year now in uh, 2016, always favored option number, number four, which is the subdivision, uh, the conservation easement, and the equitable deviation. However, we have in the past, and we will in the future, support whatever option the council chooses, as long as it preserves this historic structure and our neighborhood uh, enjoyment of its presence. And on behalf of the uh, association, I would like to thank a staff for all the work that's gone into this over the last four years. Previous councils, including Mayor Gallion and Council Member Cook, who were on the previous councils, and the present council for your consideration of this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Pat, 
Pulverenti, P-U-L-V-I-R-E-N-T-I, Sonoma. Council members and city staff, I would like to respectfully request or express, actually, my disappointment in how the city of Sonoma has managed two properties bequeathed to them by two generous Sonoma citizens, Henry Mazanavi and Pauline Bond. For many years, city employees rented both of these properties. Although rents were being collected, for some reason, the city chose not to maintain either property, resulting in the Bond house needing to be demolished, and here we are discussing another demolition of a city-owned property, the Mazanavi Cottage. I would hate to think what would have happened to the Mazanavi House if the League for Historic Preservation hadn't taken responsibility for funding renovation of the house. My first thought was to suggest the city seek grant funds and convert this cottage into a shelter for a homeless family to supplement our SOS facility. However, I have since discovered that homeless shelters require an on-site manager, which would not be easily accommodated by this cottage-style home. Another option you might consider is converting the cottage into an affordable housing unit. It is my understanding that dollars may be, the, be available both at federal and state levels, although I'm not sure now after hearing the previous speaker, um, and grants that provide and help cities with affordable housing, which could help offset the expense of renovation. The city of Sonoma certainly needs to explore every opportunity to add to their affordable housing inventory. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Pat. Good evening. I'm Robert Demler, 649 First Street West, Sonoma. Uh, tonight I'd like to speak both as president of the League for Historic Preservation and I have a couple of personal comments at the end which I will identify as personal. Uh, David, the cost for the Masonavi house renovation is carried on our books for 861000 which the city kindly com uh, contributed 300 so the League made up the balance. We're still recovering, and we're trying to, with your help, do something about those expenses. Mm -hmm. We don't regret doing it, though, <laughs> for sure. Um, now, I've polled the board, and we've discussed it uh, a number of times, this issue. And there's the, the board is unanimous in those who expressed their opinion, which is more than half of the board. To, even today, I called for a late uh, expression opinion. And they want to see the cottage preserved because it's an integral part of the original parcel, even though they were two parcels, but the original tr track of land, which is kind of unusual in Sonoma, having both, cottage, both cottage have, cottages having been built in 1910, and with some similarity of architectures, more than some actually, and we are not in the position to urge the city to spend four hundred and fourteen thousand dollars. That's that's a, that's absurd. I don't think the city can afford that. The league can certainly not afford another huge uh, campaign to take this on. So, um, with some trepidation, I urge you in some way to put this building in a holding pattern so that it can be preserved until some better idea or some someone with deep pockets comes through with that better idea. Um, I know it to have a little park there would be nice. Uh, we, the League, would like to see some way that we can connect the barracks or what are, parking lot, the, the big parking lot behind the barracks. It's not the barracks. So connect it to the Masonati House for events to alleviate the traffic on the street and the parking on the streets. Um, that has great appeal to us. Yes, we could use archival storage, uh, but we would be happy if the house were just put into a, a condition uh, as as a holding pattern, as I just said, so that nothing w it could so it could not deteriorate any further. Um, the, the idea that it was declared historically insignificant 
is always, we go through this at every meeting. We went through it last uh, Tuesday, I guess it was, at Design Review. Um, you, you can get an either kinds of, both kinds of opinions, historically significant or not significant. And the house itself is probably not historically significant in itself, but as a package uh, with the Mason Abbey Cottage, I think a case could be made for a, a, a mini historical landscape. So those are the, um, those are the league's board's opinion. My personal opinion is, if you have to demolish it, and we would all be regretful, and I, from, from what I gather from the league, there would be some uh, civic opposition, maybe led by the league, uh, I would certainly not want to see a dog run because we have events at the league, and that would increase the traffic in that area and the noise in that area. So I'm over oh, time. You're over time. I'm and, sorry. And that's just a little birthday present for you. Oh, thank you very, very much. So uh, it, it's a tough decision for you all. It always is. Preservation over is time never black, is black over and white. time. Bye. Thank you. Hello. My name is Will Honeyborn. I spell that H O N E Y B O U R N E, resident of Sonoma. And um, I'm a member of the. Uh, Sonoma Valley Historical Society. Um, and look, the first pitch that I want to make is consistent with what everybody else has said. This, um, we need to do everything we can to protect the structure of this building. I'm informed that um, there have been 42 buildings, houses um, demoed um, between 2000 and 2011 in the city of Sonoma. You can check these facts for me. Um, or for the, for the council. Uh, 29 in historic overlay or in Broadway district, all except two over 50 years old, most of them well before 1950. And that begs the question, what are we doing to encourage our residents to appreciate our local heritage? So the most important thing is to save this building. If the council decides to save it, and hopefully, as I said, you will, then, and I, before I get into that, I think the point that was made there, not only is it historically significant building, but it supports the historical landscape, and that may be equally important. But if you decide to save it, please consider leasing it to the Sonoma Valley Historical Society as a viable and worthwhile option. It wasn't listed in the material, but it was mentioned verbally. To provide context for consideration, let me read to you the mission of this society, which is to provide a forum and resource for the study and dissemination of Sonoma Valley history for present and future generations by identifying, collecting, preserving, and sharing artifacts, documents, and images. So you can see from an archival standpoint, it's highly relevant. This is a very active organization with growing membership, serves the Sonoma community well, has a long track record of a proven, reliable, fiscal, responsible tenant. With more historically significant documentation being continually contributed, the society has an ever-expanding archive need and is need for more space. A recent example is the contribution from the Chamber of Commerce archives. The train cars and the off-site storage are full to capacity. While a small Marcy house will provide additional space for historical research, storage, and document processing, it will be insufficient to meet the society's growing needs. So in summary, your consideration of the option to lease the Mason Harvey Cottage to the Sonoma Valley Historical Society would be sincerely appreciated and could be quickly followed up with more detailed discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. Um, more comment? And please, if there's anyone else wishing to speak on this, please stand and queue up. Thank you. Thank you. Jack Wagner, Fano Lane. Um, I like the idea of getting this into a public housing or affordable housing kind of unit. I don't like the idea of getting a vacation rental there. I think if the city wants to make more money off tourism, we have the TOT for that. Um, and if you gotta demolish it, uh, just get us a couple of sledgehammers and me and Gary can just go at it. You know, No, I don't think we could actually do that. Um, yeah, I think that everyone else kind of summed it up, but I just wanted to show my support for uh, keeping this around. Thanks, guys.
Thank you very much, Jack. And uh, I see our design review uh, commissioner back there. Um, this is Council Barnett. Uh, are you wishing to enter into public comment? Well, you have to come and speak. At <laughs> you can come to the podium. Kelso Barnett, Merry Christmas. Um, I hope I'm legally allowed to speak on this. Uh, I have to recuse from this item anyway due to proximity, so I feel like I have some right to speak on it. Through the attorney? That's sort of... This is a city-owned property. Wouldn't want to get in trouble. Hmm. If you speak only to how it will affect your own real property interests, you have every right to do that. If you want to talk about global issues, the impact on the historical quality of the entire city, uh, small town character, those things are off limits. It has to be limited to how it uh, affects your own personal interests and your own real property. Thank you. Uh, that's, that will be difficult um, to sort of parse up here. So. Um, I will, uh, can I give context for the history of this? Because you talked about the design review commission earlier in terms of how we recommended against demolition. Can I give context or uh, who ultimately, if I it, go over the line, who, it, well, each, each council and each mayor has or? its own policies with okay. respect to having, uh, commissioners from other agencies coming in and testifying about a decision that's already been made. And mm -hmm. it, it receives different approaches by different uh, councils. Um, so I sort of leave that to the, the mayor and the councils, whether it wishes to um, learn more about the context as you perceived it uh, occurring at the lower body's uh, pr uh, proceedings. I would, um, I would just say, are other council members interested in that decision? And if so, we could proceed. If not, we will um, take Mr. Barnett off the hook. How, why we made the decision, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, since I wasn't here back in, I think, two, did this start in 2011 when this first bubbled up? Is that when it went to the design review? So I wasn't here during there, but I heard it was a big community turnout. So I wanted to hear from somebody about uh, the community view from that since I wasn't here to see it for myself. Jeff. Is that something that we should ask him to come up later and comment on after public comment is closed? Uh, no, I think this would be the appropriate time to do it if, Thank if, you. if it's allowable. All right. Ask your question again. And So back when this first came up, I heard that there was a big uh, showing of public support um, for the cottage, and sort of that's what happened after the... Council made its decision and then ended up with you guys. So if you could tell me about the context of what was happening around then. So from what I understand, the council recommended demolition of the property or of the cottage. Um, but because the design review commission reviews all uh, applications for demolition in the um, in Sonoma, especially over a certain age, they referred it to us. Whether they had to or not, I'm not sure, but they referred it to us. Uh, I recused myself because of proximity at that meeting, but I can speak to the context of it. Um, the whole, a large uh, number of people came out from the neighborhood um, expressing concern that the historic resource evaluation that was in your agenda packet tonight um, may or may not have been, uh, people disagreed with the conclusions of that. And I believe Mr. Uh, Costello brought up a letter that was submitted to the Design Review Commission back then, um, disagreeing with the conclusions of that, and I believe asking for uh, possibly a peer review of that. And so um, I believe the Design Review Commission did not uh, do a peer review just because I believe at that point that was still pretty new. Uh, we've since started to do that. Um, but they did, as a result of that letter and the belief that this was a historic resource, deny the application for demolition. Now, at that point, I believe the city council could have just, if they really wanted to proceed with it, obviously overrule. Um, and, Thank but, you very much. Okay. 
Thank you very thank much. You. And thank you for your work on that commission. All right, Jeff, anything further at this point? Okay. Uh, anyone else? Last chance to speak on public comment on this issue. With that, I'll close this and bring it back to council for discussion, decisions, motions. Yes. Council Member Cook. Well, I'll go ahead and start. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to say is probably going to be disappointing to most people in this room, um, uh, but I do respect the public comment that I heard tonight. Sitting on the facilities committee um, and looking at city-owned property and um, looking at the best use of what needs to happen, um, looking at dollars and cents. Coming from an individual like myself who moved to Sonoma because of history, but there is a time that you use it or you lose it. And I've been to the Mazanavi cottage and looked at it, and it's in terrible shape. Probably the worst shape I've, I've seen a building. Um, so it makes me wonder, what do we do with that property? And looking at the different options that we have, um, I thought we had a deal where we were going to turn it into a vacation rental um, through uh, trying to save our history. Um, that didn't work mostly because I think it, um, what the property looks like. What I would like to see is the demolition, the demolition of the cottage, but have it used as a park setting. I think that um, going back to use it or lose it, um, I think that there's a lot of stuff that we can do there. Um, I don't want to board it up and let it sit for another 10 years because then it'll just get worse and then there'll be kicking the can down the road to the next council that finally um, decides that it has to go. So tonight, um, just so my colleagues, that's why I wanted to go first, is I do believe that um, in option number two, and I apologize um, because I do love the history. We do have a lot of buildings in Sonoma that we really need to just, um, like the Blue Wing, just try to save whatever we can but with this one, with the Mazanavi's um, house being so beautiful there and looking at removing that and having a nice park setting where um, individuals from Sonoma um, could use it for different activities, I think that would be a benefit for the city. Okay. Okay. Council Member Hendley. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting over this Christmas cold. Um, so I have, first have a question for our planning director. <laughs> Um, I read back in 2001 that there was a proposal to put a children's museum in there. There was a group of um, moms in town that wanted to do that. What, how did that discussion end? Well, um, that proposal involved, the, and at least as I recall, the entirety of the properties. So they were looking for doing a discovery museum that included an outdoor component as well as an indoor component. And so they, their proposal actually involved both parcels and the the council ultimately was more interested in um, work you know in the end that there were competing proposals the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art uh, was uh, interested in the property but in the end the, the council chose to work with the league um, I think this is it's a tricky one um, some of my goals this year one of them was to along the lines of celebrating history. I think history is a grossly under-leveraged asset that the city has. I think it could be a huge source of economic res revenue. I think it could be um, you know, something that brings the community together. And um, even, even though I think that this one, it, it, sh it seems like a challenging project, I just couldn't accept having my first, uh, you know, approach at a historical property and then decide to tear it down because we can't decide what to do with it. Um, I think at the very least, um, I've heard about peer reviews. I know that in some situations where there is one report and there's a, you know, some respected historian who disagrees that there's a process of sending it out for sort of a an official second opinion, and I think that at the very least, out of respect to this property, I think that we should um, look into that just to see, just to see if you know maybe this is something 
more than what the, the initial historical report said it was. Um, I think that I think about future uses that we might might want, whether it's a history museum or a children's museum or any kind of facility that we might the community might want, and then we'd have to either find a building for it or construct a building. And in that regard, it seems kind of silly to me that we're going to be tearing down a building now and then maybe in the future needing something that won't be as meaningful. And then of course, the other thing about history is it's a, as a dwindling asset. I'm, I'm, I wonder about the accuracy of the numbers of the demolitions in town. I don't, they're probably not that far off, but you know, once it's gone, it's gone forever. So you could see it as kicking the can down the road for us to not make a definitive decision to tear it down now. But there's some decisions that once it's gone, it's gone forever. So I think that if there's any viable solution out there, and we thought we had one, it would have been nice if it had worked out. Unfortunately not. Um, it could be we could, you know, search the community, see if anybody wants to come in and have this really prime location to put a project um, right next to the park. It could be that in the end we can't find any anyone that will help us with it and we'll have to tear it down, but I think that it's worth exploring our additional options. Um, so for, for this, um, I am not ready to sign a death sentence on this building. I think that there could be a creative solution out there that's going to help save the building and then also give the community something that we could really benefit from. So I would like to uh, keep moving forward and you know, put our heads together and see if we can think of something that we haven't thought of yet. Okay, Council Member Edwards. So, um, <clears throat> So I've walked through the building. I've also gone and done two cleanup projects on the building. It's sat for years, um, overgrown with weeds. I think we found maybe 70 or 80 baseballs in there because they come over the Little League fence. Uh, when we did the last cleanup, I actually brought my tractor over there. Um, we did tear down the barn. That was in the back. I don't know how many people remember the barn being in the back of it. Um, and we actually tried to offer that off to a farmer, but there was uh, lead paint in it, so it had to go through the proper process and the wood couldn't be reused. Um, as I mentioned earlier um, to David, the last time I looked at it, it was just a mess. Um, worse condition than I've ever seen it. Um, if, you know, if I had my way, I would, I would, um, uh, I would tear it down I would take that property and add it to the Masonavi house and preserve the land itself and the gardens and extend have the beautiful gardens that we have at the at the Masonavi house and extend that and make it a more viable opportunity for the Masonavi house to be productive and earn the money the five hundred and sixty one thousand dollars that was mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> you know that's that's the nut that they're cracking on that and I, I just don't see uh, especially in the condition it is after the most recent developers came through. Um, I think it, it did irreparable harm to the building. And um, so I would lean more, you know, with all due respect to the neighborhood, I've talked to many of the neighbors as well, and they're, um, and some who no longer live here that were in the neighborhood and part of the organization. Um, uh, you know, it'd be my suggestion to take it down, to, uh, have the, the least cost to the city uh, in the long run, in my opinion. But we'd also preserve it as an opportunity if we had the money to build something else, um, whether it be some affordable opportunity, historic affordable. But a, a building like that could be redone, especially in the small size that it is. And there's a lot of projects I've seen around the country in my travels that where uh, replicas have been done that uh, have the sense of that era. Um, and as far as the number of houses that have been torn down, there's a lot of houses that needed to be torn down in this town that weren't really built that well. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm probably the only one up here who owns a historic building in Sonoma. And um, you know, my plan and my kids' plan in their in my trust is to keep it that way forever. And I've improved it the years that I've owned it, and will continue to do that. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna lean in the direction of. Um, I don't want to kick the can further down the road. So, all right, and Mayor Pro Tem so Agramonte. Much. Thank you so much, David. Um, may I ask a question? When bench benchmark 
Hoover took a look at it, and they, was that something they requested to take on themselves, or was that after a long discussion of of what's happening with that the, with the cottage, and no one came forward? Well, again, when the council wanted to um, hold off on demolition, look at different options, the, the method by which the council chose to do that was to circulate a request for proposals uh, inviting ideas for the property. And essentially that request outlined what the city could do with the property, which you know, admittedly was not that much, um, at least at that time. Um, the city agreed to take the barn down. The city agreed to correct um, the electrical connection and the city agreed to provide um, handicapped access to the street. But, uh, and, and just invited all comers. Well, we only had one proposal and that was from Benchmark Hoover and that was after extending the deadline for requests. Now, you know, that was then, this is now. There might be other ideas for the use of the property, but the, the benchmark option, which, you know, staff certainly supported that option, we're sorry it didn't work out. That was the only option available at the time. I, I think I Well, understand. I should take that. Oh, I mean, sorry. apart from equitable deviation, which has also been on the table for a while. And I think that they felt that it was cost prohibitive. Is that correct? I mean, it was just... Well, when they really started to work hard at developing their designs and costing out their designs, they determined that it exceeded um, their original estimates by a substantial margin. Mm -hmm. I think I agree with Council Member Edwidge with respect to the Mazanavi House. I've been there, I've seen it. I think it has so many wonderful things in its in its future, and I would imagine with the league's um, strategic planning, I think that they are hoping for more uh, that that can be um, offered in that property. And I'm leaning towards uh, Council Member Cook and uh, Edwards on this as well of the demolition. Um, yes, I just want to remind Council there's still no motion on the table, so I'd be entertaining a motion at any point, and Council Member Hundley. I have a follow-up question or comment. Um, my problem with this perspective is I know that when we received this property, it wasn't in pristine condition, but obviously it was, um, it was good enough for us to have a city employee working there, and apparently now it's in complete disrepair. So I think it's a terrible example of the city being gifted this historical asset and then letting it fall apart to the extent where we have to tear it down. Some cities have laws against this. It's called demolition by neglect, and that's exactly what we're let happening. So how can we expect other people in the city to take care of their historical assets when we have one here? We, we've let it deteriorate. Now we almost have no option but to knock it down because it's going to be such an ex uh, expense. But I think it's... I think it's a, a bad example for what we should be doing, and it's a, it's a very unfortunate end. So. Uh, yes, Council Member Cook. I would like to make a motion that um, the council does number two, the demolition, demolition of the Mazanavi Cottage. And do I hear a second? I'll second that. All right, we have a first and a second. I'll go ahead and give my discussion point. I would not be voting in support of this. Um, I um, have been on the record for voting for demolition, but had that been the case, we might never have seen the proposal by Benchmark Hoover. I feel that we have not fully exhausted all processes that we can go forward with, but I might be in a, min a minority here on, on council. I feel that number one, you know, had that vote gone through, had design review gone ahead and approved that, um, Benchmark Hoover would not be there. I have great respect for um, uh, prior mayor um, Joe Costello and his vision of what he sees in the city. Um, I agree with Pat and her uh, opinions as well. I think that possibly we need one more exclusion where we are able to say this will not work, this option will not work, this option will not work, and we are down to demolition. I don't think we have gone through uh, enough steps for this. But that's my opinion. 
Um, you can see by how the council is staging right here that they feel it, that those positions have been exhausted. I have full confidence in the city facilities committee and what they've decided, um, you know, in the past for some of the city owned facilities, um, staff. So, um, I would just like to offer that as a, you know, a kind of Hail Mary here in the uh, option of what's before you today. And with that, we'll call for a roll call vote. Council Member Hundley? No. Council Member Cook? Aye. Council Member Agramonte? Aye. Council Member Edwards? Yes. Mayor Gallion? Nay. And with that, we have resolved that, um, that on a vote of three to two, that um, the demolition uh, use for park activities option, I believe, or demolition in itself, is the option that the council has chosen. All right, and uh, just to be clear, this is basically a sense of the council. Um, mm -hmm. There are additional steps that would need to be taken to actually formalize this decision, including findings for demolition. So um, we would just, based on tonight's vote, return with um, next steps. Right, and uh, with that, I would like to take a five minute recess. The meeting, and I believe before us is item 7C, um, discussion, consideration, possible action on a draft resolution that makes findings of exemption from CEQA pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15061B3 and 2 confirms the existing development code prohibition on medical marijuana dispensaries and related activities. Planning Director David Goodison. Thank you, Mayor Galley and members of the City Council. Back in October, Governor Brown signed into law what is known as the Medical Marijuana Regulation and Safety Act, which established comprehensive state-level regulations on medical marijuana. Now, currently, the City's Development Code prohibits medical marijuana dispensaries and related activities, such as delivery services and cultivation. After this new law was adopted, we received a number of inquiries as to whether that had any implications in terms of the prohibitions in effect at the city level. And so the city attorney uh, has examined this issue very thoroughly. And while he concludes that the act does not override local land use authority, uh, the city does need to take steps to reaffirm its authority in order to preserve it. Um, in terms of the existing prohibition, Sonoma's zoning ordinance or development code is what is what is known as a permissive ordinance. And actually that phrase has perhaps kind of the opposite meaning of the implication. Um, because as set forth in the development code, a use that is not specifically identified as being allowed is considered to be prohibited. That's set forth very clearly in the development code. Um, so it's been a long standing determination of planning staff that medical marijuana dispensaries and related uses such as delivery services are unlike any other allowed use identified in the development code and are therefore prohibited. This interpretation has previously been reported to and accepted by the City Council, most recently over the course of 2007-2009 when the Council was exploring the concept of allowing dispensaries within city limits subject to regulation. Now, Ultimately that didn't come to pass, but as part of that discussion there was a very thorough um, review by the City Council of what the existing rules were and what the development code meant with respect to medical marijuana. Now moving on to this recently adopted um, act, uh, the main effect is to again establish broad statewide regulatory framework for the regulation of medical marijuana. And it does have potential implications with respect to local land use regulations. 
Generally speaking, it appears that the legislative intent is to allow cities and counties to continue to adopt local regulations up to and including prohibitions on dispensaries, delivery services, personal cultivation, and commercial growing operations. <laughs> but in order to protect the city's regulatory authority, it must first be made manifest and reconfirmed. The most significant issue in this regard relates to cultivation. Under the Act, there's a February 29th deadline to ban or regulate the cultivation of medical cannabis. Otherwise, the city's current prohibition would be automatically eliminated and the state would become the sole authority in terms of licensing and regulating such cultivation. And in fact, the city would at least potentially risk losing its authority to ever impose locally based regulations on cultivation. To comply with that February 2016 deadline, such a local prohibition may take the form of an existing permissive zoning scheme that does not expressly list medical cannabis cultivation as a permitted use. And as currently discussed, the city has that zoning framework, and so that is an option that's before the city council. The uh, ordinance that's been drafted by the city attorney would address um, a number of key activities, including cultivation. Those include um, possession, manufacture, processing, storing, laboratory testing, and transportation. Um, cultivation is separately defined and delivery uh, is also separately defined in the act and the resolution that's been crafted by the city attorney would address all three of those components and would in essence reaffirm the existing local local prohibitions on those activities um, but we recognize that obviously the most the, the time that the most recently discussed whether or not it wanted to modify the rules with respect to medical marijuana was in 2009 and the composition of the council has changed since then uh, we're not suggesting that this is the, the be-all and end-all of regulation of medical marijuana in the city of Sonoma. This council might want to relook at different issues related to um, city regulation of medical marijuana. However, it's staff's view that in order to protect its regulatory authority, it is um, the, the city's best option is to adopt this resolution. It does not preclude you from taking the time, if there's interest on the council, to look at uh, more permissive regulations in any of the areas addressed in the resolution. But it does protect your authority to um, keep local control and adopt local regulations. So our recommendation is that you adopt this resolution affirming the existing development code prohibitions on medical marijuana dispensaries and related activities. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to offload them to the city attorney. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, council questions? Anyone? I see no. Madam Mayor, raised. may I just offer a couple of, of comments? Uh, Great. Un job. Unsolicited. I apologize for that. But I think it's important to realize that for some reason, this new legislation has selected uh, two aspects of the medical marijuana chain from cultivation to manufacturing to product, uh, creating, creating uh, edibles and other uh, products that, are, that contain cannabis to transporting it to dispensing it to delivering it the whole and buying it that entire chain now is going to be regulated by the state of California um, I believe there are six separate licenses maybe more that the state will be issuing for each of those steps and if you don't have a state <coughs> license Plus, if you don't have a local permit, you can't do it. And you have to get the local permit first. But only in those jurisdictions that, per that permit them. The law acknowledges that cities and counties retain their local land use regulation authority to prohibit altogether any or all of those pieces of the medical marijuana chain. The new law targets two components of that chain. One is cultivation, and the other is delivery. It states that if, the, if a city or county does not by March 1 have in place a regulation or a ban on cultivation, then it will be deemed allowed, and it will only be regulated by the state pursuant to a state license pursuant, pursuant to state regulations. So it, it, it removes the cultivation piece from the city's powers to regulate it, even if you wanted to. Now, the author of this legislation says that that deadline was a mistake. 
and that he's going to repeal it. But we don't know when or if that will ever happen. So the cities and counties throughout the state are scrambling to meet this March 1 deadline. Now, most cities and counties have what David has already described our ordinance to be, and that's a permissive zoning ordinance. And in sort of layman's vernacular, if it ain't listed, it ain't allowed. Mm -hmm. And we don't have medical marijuana cultivation, indoors or outdoors, uh, in any form listed in our list of permitted or conditionally permitted uses in our zoning code. So it's deemed prohibited. Theoretically, there would be no need to take the action you're taking tonight because the city's code already bans cultivation. But the league is recommending, and many cities, most cities that I know of, are adopting resolutions simply confirming that fact so it's very clear to the public how each county board and city council construes its own zoning code vis-a-vis -vis medical marijuana. And that's why the resolution is before you tonight. The other, the other item is delivery. Mm -hmm. That will need to come back to you because the, this new law says that you can't rely on a permissive zoning scheme to prohibit delivery. <laughs> you have to expressly, actually expressly, explicitly in your zoning code or other land use regulation, either ban it or allow it with regulations and conditions. So that, there's no deadline on that. So that will be coming back to you later for, for more definitive uh, action by the council. Probably it will go to the commission first and then come to the council second. If such a ban or regulation is not in place by the time the state finally gets around to promulgating its own regulations regarding delivery, then those will trump anything that the city might thereafter try to do. So the question then becomes, well, how soon are those state regulations going to be on the books, right? We want to beat them. They're, the estimate is that they'll be in place somewhere near January 2018. Mm -hmm. So we now have 16 and 17, two years that the state, state's going to st uh, spend developing regulations. Um, and at any point during that two-year period, they might finally get around to doing it, completing them, and then issuing licenses for deliveries. We need to, by that time, have already in place something that the city council thinks is appropriate, and we will be coming back with something hopefully in the next uh, three to five months to, to address deliveries. But tonight the focus is primarily on cultivating. You can always change your mind. The new law um, implies and, and I think expressly states that if you were to ban, you know, today, tonight's a status quo. It's a declaration that everything is just as is. And that then will be in place before March 1. And after March 1, if there's some a direction given by council that you'd like to revisit any or all of these issues, then uh, that that would th could occur, and you can change your mind and actually regulate any or all of these components, and then we can draft um, various conditions that you might find appropriate or not. But this this I think is primary. The primary impact of tonight's action is to reaffirm local control, assure it's in place, declare it, let the public know it's in place and then reserve uh, a later time for any additional uh, investigation the council might direct. Oh, shades of redevelopment. Um, <laughs> all right, um, council member Hunsley, no, you're good. Anyone else have questions? All right, with that I'd like to go ahead and open it up to the public and to uh, please speak on this action before us tonight. Hi, my name is Fred Allabach at 19550, <clears throat> and I'm concerned about what all these regulatory frameworks and zoning and local control might have impact on my joint checking account. Thank you. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Well, let's keep going. Justin Bovee, B-O-V-I-E. Justin? Justin? Yeah. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. My name is Justin Bovee, and I was raised in the city of Sonoma. I am also a cannabis professional. As the owner and operator of Greenlight Alternatives, a delivery service, I, along with my wife, provide high-quality medical marijuana to patients in Sonoma and Marin counties. 
I'm here tonight to provide a cannabis industry pers perspective on the regulatory changes and implementation challenges of the California Medical Marijuana Regulation and Safety Act, MRSA, and to urge you to reject the approval of the draft resolution confirming the prohibition of medical marijuana dispensaries and related activities. Please consider a placeholder ordinance instead. Admittedly, the timelines for local elected officials to understand and act upon local regulations are short, and the information has been difficult to obtain. Sonoma County as it, and its nine cities are all reviewing existing policies regarding cannabis-related activities within their jurisdictions. What we do know is that bans on cannabis activity within any jurisdiction will negatively impact the community and environment by allowing bad actors to skirt environmental and public safety regulations, putting increased pressure on citizens and law enforcement alike. Alternatively, city council's support for both reasonable cannabis industry regulation and permitting structures will positively impact the economy, ensure patient access to the medicine they have been prescribed, support small and medium-sized cannabis businesses, increase the tax base and allow the city to create rules to manage cannabis related activities within the city limits and clarify the rights and responsibilities of patients who cultivate their own medicine. The state of California passed MRSA because it recognized the positive effects a regulated cannabis industry would have on the economy, the environment and public safety. It has also empowered local governments to implement those regulations because they are vital to the safety and economic development of local communities. These decisions require careful deliberation and should not be made hastily and without the information needed to make informed decisions. Cannabis industry groups such as the Sonoma County Growers Alliance and Americans for Safe Access are ready, willing, and able to work with local elected officials to help them understand both the complexities and the opportunities that come with implement implementation of MRSA regulations. I therefore ask that for now, you vote no on the resolution in question and please instead consider a placeholder ordinance in lieu of a ban. Take some more time to engage with your local industry groups and learn the positive contributions of the cannabis industry as it becomes increasingly more relevant to Sonoma County and most importantly, recognize that short-sighted action at this time may do more harm than good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justin. Next. I also have some um, papers. Good evening, I'm Tawny Logan with the Sonoma County Growers Alliance, the executive director of this group. Um, I'm here to speak to you today on this agenda item for the resolution. The way I see it as I'm reading through your considerations are threefold. One, you have a ban in place and that has served your needs so far. You have state regulations that have placed a March 1st deadline in front of you. So that's pushing you to make a decision quickly. And I think that with the leadership that we have coming from Sonoma County on a state legislative side, that there could be a more open discussion about a comprehensive ordinance that can integrate different license types that do reflect your community here in the city of Sonoma. You also have a patient base that needs access to cannabis that cannot or choose not to use pharmaceuticals for different reasons. They need access. With, not, with, with no dispensary here, and I understand the concerns with the dispensary in the community, but also not allowing delivery, you're not allowing your patients to have access, your local community who relies on this medicine for their ailments. So the discussion needs to be open and continue. The third piece that I think is needing to be brought forward is that when you make a resolution to continue a ban, you are sending a message out to your current existing cannabis industry. You have families here. You have good, compliant operators that want permits, that want to live here, whose children go to school here, that would like to pay taxes and participate like every other industry. For the first time in our history, we have an opportunity to do that. And there are so many people who have been in this industry for so long, there's no changing. So if you set this ban in place, when, uh, not, when the other eight cities and the county are all considering placeholder ordinance, you stand the chance of losing your good actors, your compliant operators. So what will those compliant operators do? What would you do if you were told that the job that you do every day will be considered illegal and you have a family? You would leave that community to go somewhere where you can have that permit and you can participate. 
And if you push your compliant operators out of this community, you're going to be left with the bad actors. You won't have the leadership here. So we're urging you to consider sending that message simultaneously, maintaining the restrictions for your March 1st deadline, saying that you recognize that the industry exists here, but that you also are going to review implementing comprehensive ordinance for your community. You see leadership happening in Sebastopol. You see the considerations happening in the other cities here in Sonoma County. The paper that I had shared with you are your resources on a state level for the folks who are coming through from the Board of Equalization and Department of Consumer Affairs and so forth for you to be able to contact for more information. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Ramsey, R-A-M-S-E-Y. Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, I'm an attorney working within the cannabis industry, and I wanted to first echo your city attorney's statement regarding the March 1st deadline. I was recently at a seminar where a representative from Assemblyman Wood's office who authored AB 243, and the intent is that it, that, uh, that deadline would be um, altered or changed completely. Uh, so I, I would reiterate that fact so eloqu eloquently put by your city attorney. I would also urge you to um, consider that previous opinion said this vote is largely symbolic. You already have um, all the mechanisms in place and all the bans in place. And by putting forward this issue now, it, do it does start the dialogue but why starting the di start the dialogue off with um, voting to exclude or otherwise uh, upset a significant part of the population with a purely symbolic vote? Um, so I would urge you to start the conversation now and not uh, go forward with uh, angering and upsetting a lot of people who rely on, on cannabis. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. More camera time. Yeah. You like that one? Jack Wagner, Fano Lane. Um, I want to remind us, maybe Kelso knows about this, that the Spasciani's did get a religious exemption during prohibition of alcohol um, to continue producing wine. Uh, I know a lot of the families continue to produce wine despite prohibition, without a religious, religious exemption, because uh, that was their culture. They came from Italy, they came from places where they made their own wine. Um, and thank God they did, because what half of our budget, or half of our tax revenues come from tourism, and half of that is contributed from wine, or our wine industry, the other half being historic uh, significance of this area. Um, I don't know what the right vote is on this. I I like local control. Um, if you were to vote as the staff recommends, um, make sure this is on the agenda soon. Um, that That's what I would say. Um, when I ran last year, this was one of the issues I talked about with the sheriff and chief of police when I met with them personally. Uh, we respectfully disagreed on the present state, though hopefully there will be some progress at the state level soon that we can maybe come back to this and have an adult conversation. I think the worst um, thing we can do is to uh, put out a, a perception of hypocrisy when, when we rely on a drug industry, it just happens to be legal. Um, so yeah, I want you to uh, continue this discussion and do what you ever you have you feel is necessary for yourselves but definitely listen to these people they're part of our community they are uh, they deserve to be listened to all right thank you thank you very much jack anyone else wishing to speak if not i'll bring it back to council for questions comments motions and uh, rachel i'll start it off so I know today we are here discussing a resolution that is acknowledging our current position, and I think that that's the right thing to do now. I definitely want to do, I know this March 1st deadline might be changed, but I, I want to stay on top of all that and 
at least keep our options open for the future. Um, but since this issue is um, on the agenda tonight, I just wanted to note that I think in 2009 was the last time this discussion happened, and it's, it's, it's amazing to think about how much has changed in the last six years, and I think in the next two years it's going to change even more. So I, it, it might be worth um, putting back on the agenda, particularly I'd be interested in discussing the option of delivery um, services because I know that there is a community in Sonoma, um, especially with our, our large senior community and people who might not be able to drive places and have needs for um, this product. So I am interested in talking about that perhaps sooner than later, and I will be supporting this resolution. Anyone else wishing to speak? Thank you so much. Um, David, as I understand it, we're, this resolution is reaffirming the existing, pro, existing prohibitions. That doesn't stop us from educating ourselves on what we've been presented with today. Uh, it just helps us learn more about what's available um, and the, the different processes with respect to, to cultivation and delivery. So this doesn't stop us from learning these things and, Correct. and evolving from that. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Edwards. So I, I remember being part of the discussion on the Planning Commission back in 09, and uh, we talked about all kinds of things that are coming up in the news now. And one of my, being an organic uh, supporter, one of my biggest things was pesticide use and all kinds of other things. But And there were issues about being close to schools and, and that sort of thing. But I always came up with this, come back to the suggestion of if we're going to have uh, cannabis, which is obviously coming, um, that maybe our hospital who struggles financially constantly should be the uh, release point dispensary for um, for cannabis, which I think would be interesting. Um, the um, I'm going to support the um, uh, the ordinance as is uh, for now, but I'm going to be wide open to conversations later. Um, you know, this is, in speaking with Mike McGuire recently, it's a 43 billion dollar industry. In California, it's bigger than the rest of agriculture combined. So it's part of our, our state. It's part of our um, local economy, whether, whether it's uh, legal or not. So um, I'm looking forward to future discussions on this. But I will be supporting the ordinance tonight. All right. And uh, Council Member Cook. I also will be supporting this tonight, um, but I do want to echo what um, Council Member Hundley said and what... Um, I've kind of heard my colleagues on, on the council. Um, it is coming, and I think that uh, I'm all about local control, so that's why I'm voting the way I'm voting. Um, but I would like to see a little bit more um, in the future for this council um, looking at how to keep up with, um, with the changing regulations at, at the state level to make sure that we keep local control. Um, do I hear anything in the form of motion? Yes. And then I will give my comments. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I would like to make a motion to reaffirm the existing prohibitions with the introduction of the resolution. Um, thank I'll you. I'll second that. Okay. Do we need to read the resolution verbiage, or is that sufficient? That is sufficient. Okay. All right, so we have a first, uh, I mean, we have a motion and we have a second. Um, I myself was in the discussion. I, I don't think I was more than just soaking feet wet when this came forward in 2008 and continued through 2009. It is a very comprehensive subject, and it was on the medical marijuana dispensaries. Um, I was, um, you know, in the, in the archives as a, as a supporter of this particular concept given the identification of we had possibly one location in Sonoma in which to go ahead and talk about this happening and a vote to develop further um, information on it. However, this was not the feeling of the council at that particular time. Um, I have been very moved. Um, anyone who works with hospice, anyone who knows, anyone who is ailing, um, uh, how beneficial um, this product is for a lot of individuals. It also represents a very serious side for enforcement and the youth and the improper use as well. 
the um, extension of um, cultivation brings up many different issues as to what's authorized use, what are the components going into it, yet this is a cottage industry for a lot of people who are going ahead and supplementing their incomes as an income for um, their families, and it's the only thing that's keeping them afloat. Um, what's appropriate here? Uh, I am open to this conversation. I am open to discussion around it. I, I feel that, number one, our community needs to weigh in on this. This does not give us any time in which to go ahead and have a, a good conversation with community. And I believe that this is um, a first step that needs to be made. I am a product of redevelopment and what they came in and swept by the state of California. I would not want to see that the state of California bypasses the entire city of Sonoma based on what they feel is their determination of what should be happening and what should not be happening. Um, so I am all for local control, and I too will be supporting this ordinance as a beginning step and a promise to our community that there will be future conversations and introductions of agenda items as the council members see fit. And with that, um, do we have any further discussion? All right. Um, okay, Gay, I think it's time for the roll call vote. Council Member Hundley? Aye. Council Member Cook? Aye. Council Member Agramonte? Aye. Council Member Edwards? Yes. Mayor Gallion? Yes. And with that, we have passed a 5 0 resolution of the City Council of the City of Sonoma reaffirming and confirming that the city's zoning code operates under principles of permissive zoning, which means that the medical marijuana dispensaries and related activities are not allowed within the city. All right, let's go ahead and move on, and thank you for your input. Um, let's go ahead and move on to item um, 7D. Excuse me. Thank you. All right, let's clear the room for a moment. Okay, so this is an item that we've all been uh, waiting for, um, discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding the annual assignments of council members to various boards and committees. Um, Carol, I believe you wish to weigh in on this? Well, I will just open up the topic. Um, annually, council members um, are assigned to represent the city on various boards and committees, and um, with the changing of the May, uh, the mayor, uh, the assignments may change as appointed by the mayor. I, I know that Mayor Gallion has had some discussions and review of appointments, and I will again turn it back to you, Mayor Gallion, for um, your appointments to the boards and commissions for the 2016 year. Thank you very much. Um, I just, um, I, I feel that this is probably uh, certainly one of the most difficult things that a mayor has to do in the beginning of, of their term, but also one of the enjoyable things. Um, I, I feel very confident in this council. Um, I admire the professionalism, and although uh, young in, in service to elected office, there certainly is the um, dedication that I find is so stimulating for both the city and outside areas. So I have... Um, done a few changes, but for the most part feel that it's important to grow in the positions that you currently have and to expand into others for um, activities. So um, we'll start at the top of the list, which is the Association of Bay Area Governments. Um, that will be um, Gary uh, Edwards and uh, David Cook as alternate. Um, Cheetah Slow Sonoma Valley Advisory Council it will be Gary Edwards as uh, prime and Rachel as alternate. City Audit Committee will be myself um, and David Cook. City Facilities Committee, um, after a little bit of deliberation, this is something that um, maybe I thought I might 
you know, put my feet into. But my goal was to go ahead and divest of some of the committees that I have so that others um, could experience this as well. And I am very um, happy with the productivity of um, both uh, David Cook and uh, Gary Edwards. So I will be reversing the order so that D Gary Edwards will be prime, David Cook will be second in that. Um, now the um, North Bay Watershed Association, um, Madeline Agramonte has, you know, absolutely delighted in her report. So I wish to continue that next year with her and showing her enthusiasm. The oversight board to the Dissolved Sonoma uh, Community Development Agency will have um, uh, David Cook and Gary Edwards as alternate. Sonoma Clean Power will continue the same uh, with David Cook as prime and Rachel Hundley as alternate. Um, the Sonoma County Health Action and Sonoma Valley Health Roundtable will change from Madeline to Gary Edwards in the continuation of all of the um, great coordination he's shown um, with the aspect of both his profession and his work in community. Uh, Sonoma County Mayor and Council Members Association Board of Directors will be myself and Madeline Agramonte. Sonoma County Mayor and Council Members Association Legislative Committee will be uh, Rachel Hundley and uh, Gary Edwards as alternate. Sonoma County Transportation Authority and Regional Climate Protection Protection will remain the same. Um, I will be prime, Madeline will be alternate. Sonoma County Waste Management Agency, Madeline will be prime, uh, city manager alternate, and public works as the director is the second alternate. Sonoma Disaster Council, which is Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem, will be m myself and Madeline. Sonoma Housing Corporation, again, is Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem, myself and Madeline. Sonoma Tourism Improvement District will continue with uh, City Manager Giovanato and Assistant City Manager Johan. Um, Sonoma Valley Citizens Advisory Commission um, will take our two Sterling Council members, Rachel Headley as prime and uh, Gary Edwards as alternate to go ahead and exist for this next year. Sonoma Valley County D Sanitation District Board of Directors will be myself and Madeline Agramonte as Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. Sonoma Valley Economic Development Steering Committee, um, which is the love of Rachel's life, uh, will continue with her uh, in prime spot. Uh, David Cook is alternate. Sonoma Valley Fire and Rescue Authority Oversight Committee will be um, myself and Madeline. Sonoma Valley Library Advisory Committee um, will remain the same with David Cook and um, Rachel Henley as the alternate. And uh, Valley of the Moon Water District City of Sonoma Ad Hoc Committee, which meets as needed, is myself and Madeline. And the Water Advisory Committee is myself and Madeline. And with that, that's the rollout for this particular year. Excuse me, Mayor Gallion. I missed the League of California Cities North Bay Division liaison. Well, maybe, maybe I forgot to say that. Well, I thought I was doing so well. It's up under City Facilities Committee. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's League of California Cities North Bay Division liaison. That would be Madeline and uh, Rachel. Thank you. All right, are there any questions about assignments? Um, I believe that's all that's required of this particular item. All right. And we will move on um, to item 7E, which is discussion, consideration, and possible action, adopting a resolution of the City Council and the City Council as successor agency, establishing the regular meeting dates for the 2016 calendar year and month of January 2017. Um, I'll go ahead and give this over to our city manager for further details. Yes, thank you, Mayor Gallion. Um, as an aid in planning the annual schedule of city meetings and also to avoid conflict with uh, various city events and major holidays, we prepared the uh, annual calendar of city meetings from January 2016 through January of 2017. Um, we've listed all the various uh, council meetings, city boards and commissions, and official city holidays. Um, and we've also added the meetings of the Mayor and Council Members Association. Uh, 
we also uh, have on there, um, we also, excuse me, um, it is determined that the mayor and the city manager can uh, ha can cancel meetings, has the authority to cancel any council meetings where it's deemed that there are not sufficient business items uh, necessary to hold a meeting. Uh, we did determine that for the first meeting in January of 2016, we will not be holding the first meeting of January. Um, we'd also determine also determine um, at this time or at a future meeting if the council would like to hold study sessions with any of its boards or commissions or any other agencies within the city we can add that to the uh, future agendas at any time and um, on the schedule and also there is the decision uh, traditionally um, the first meeting of August, the council tends to go dark for uh, a council vacation time. So the council will need to make that decision as well if they want to choose to do that in 2016. So um, it is the council's option at this time. If you wish to go through month by month, we can do that and do a quick review of the upcoming calendar so that we can um, look at what our upcoming meetings are when they are and if there's any comments to each month so if that's what how you would like to proceed we can do that right now okay questions of uh, council for city manager yes uh, David Cook yeah I'd like to state that um, I like the schedule except for I just wanted to mention we always talk about going dark in August and we always have a special meeting so I would recommend not having a dark because uh, the city manager along with the mayor can always cancel that meeting if deemed um, you know low priority of, of agenda items okay any other comments on that do we have a consensus that we do not want to go dark on that I don't know that I necessarily agree on that but um, for we mm. mm, wish we could go dark in June but we have budget um, and we're usually ironing out things in July getting them ready to go dark in August um, if we if we do not go ahead and put this together do you anticipate any particular action coming forward that would necessitate a special meeting in August? Um, not not at this time. Not at this time. I think we uh, we did last last year. I think remember. we've done it for the last two years. I think we even had yeah, major but, but we will we will endeavor not to have any any meetings in, in August. Because I think our filing date and maybe Gay, you could comment on this. Our filing date for any issues around election would be when? What's our last date? Mid mid August normally. It's mid August. Mid August. So that the meeting on the fifteenth may suffice for that particular item. I'd like to continue to be dark on the first. I'd like to skip a meeting in August if we can. All right. Okay. So. If we have consensus, I will take under consideration the fact that we will try not to schedule a special meeting during that time period, all right? And that we will work, if we had to, I think we should work in the month of July to make sure that that happens. And we do have several, um, several meetings. We will have a Wednesday meeting in July because of 4th of July. So there is a possibility that if we had to have a placeholder, I would put a placeholder some somewhere in the last week of July so that we could go ahead and um, at least have those two free weeks in August off. So, or predicating something else. All right. Um, do we have any special consideration for study sessions? Um, anything that the council members would like to see or perhaps you'd like to think about that and maybe possibly schedule them as we develop our agenda in the next year so does staff have appropriate direction 
Yes, and I would. Um, you're all, you're all very good at this. But I would would ask um, and remind you all that if you do have, if you do know your vacation schedules, mm -hmm. um, when you find those out, if you could let us know, and so that we, if we know you, and there are unavoidable, uh, sometimes unavoidable, that you are on vacation or you are going to be absent for a council meeting. I mean, that, that is unavoidable. You do have obligations outside of your council activities. If you're going to be gone for a meeting and you know it well ahead of time, if you can let me know when you know that you're not going to be here, um, that way if I, I can schedule agenda items, you know, if I know that, that there's not going to be a full council compliment up on the dais. So um, I would just ask that you uh, let me know. Well, in, in general, Carol, Carol, if we are going to be leaving town, you, you still would like to know that as well. Yes. Because should you be trying to communicate and we're not responding, um, you at least have an idea why. All right. So with that, I think staff has direction. Oh, no, we have to have a hey, vote. There's a resolution. You need a motion and a second and a vote on the resolution. Okay. All right. Oh, and yes, public comment. Oh, geez, I'm just ready to advance right through this. All right, so let's go ahead and um, go to public comment. Anyone wishing to speak on this? Uh, seeing none, I'll go ahead and bring it back to council. I will entertain a motion if someone is willing to make it. I will it. move to um, for action regarding the annual assignment of council members to various boards and committees, including uh, acceptance of the calendar. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have a second? Um, those are two different items, 7D and 7E, because I'm voting no on 7E, so oh, I don't want to. I want to vote. Oh, 7D all right. did not have a vote. Sorry. Then I I apologize. I limit that to 7D. No, 7E. E. 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 To E. Correct. All right. So we have we have a motion, and do we have a second? I will second that. All right, so we have a motion, a second, and now we will do roll call. Just for my own clarification, it's a motion and a second to adopt the resolution, which includes going dark the first meeting in August. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank Council you member, for restating that. Council member Hundley? Yes. Council member Cook? No. Council member Agramonte? Aye. Council member Edwards? Yes. Mayor Gallion? Aye. All right, we have a 4 to 0 vote. Um, to accept um, the uh, four to one, I'm sorry, vote. <sighs> All right, to go ahead and accept this and then to uh, move on to our next item. Our next item, I believe, is our committee reports. Me, no, hold on one second, let me get my agenda out. <coughs> Do you have the agenda? Okay. So the next next item on the agenda, after 70 is regular calendar city council as successor agency. There are no items that are uh, being brought forth on that. So now it is council member reports and comments. And yes. David, go ahead and start. I'll make it short and sweet. Just want to say happy holidays to everyone. And it looks like our next meeting will be January 20th. So I'll see everybody in the new year. And I have nothing to report with the committees because I haven't attended any because they haven't been scheduled. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone? Yes, Rachel. I also didn't have any committee meetings. But I will say that I am thrilled about my committees for the next year and the Economic Development Steering Committee is doing really awesome things and Carol is with us so I wanted another year of doing that full time and um, happy holidays to everyone if you're traveling be safe and maybe we'll get some snowflakes this Christmas <laughs> I'd like to add thank you thank you uh, council member D uh, cook regarding wishing everyone happy holidays the other thing is I'm so happy uh, to relinquish uh, health action as well as um, the health roundtable. I think that my tenure there has um, has has been um, 
well worth my time and I've really enjoyed it, but I feel that it's time to leave space for someone else with respect to this issue. And once you get involved with the Health Roundtable as well as Health Action, you will have great respect for the county. You won't even hate PRMD, possibly. <laughs> that's a broad statement there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Councilmember Edwards. <laughs> I get to go this time. Yes. Okay. I was hoping you forgot. Um, I just want to uh, uh, wish everyone happy holidays, especially uh, city staff and everybody who makes all of this possible uh, for us. I wanted to report that um, I was out uh, ringing bells at Safeway with my four-and-a-half-year-old son oh. the other day, and he managed to bring in about $300 for um, oh. which Rotary brings in to give to fish. Um, so... Uh, Sullivan, if you're watching, I don't think you are. It's a little late, but thank you very much. It was great to have him there, and it was, I don't have a dog, so it was great having my son there because everybody stopped and put money in. So, um, And then I just wanted to report that um, the, um, uh, the for sale sign came down at Irma Castillo's home, and I believe there's a contractor. I've had a few phone calls with the great work that the IT and their um, news report did. A lot of people have stepped up. The Sonoma Valley Rotary Club is paying for the city fees. And um, I want to thank all my fellow Rotarians for making that happen. And um, uh, more to come on that. And hopefully we can keep at least one person uh, for these holidays in their home. So thank That's you. That's great. Well, I'll go ahead. And I, I have met. I've had um, three meetings. I'll report on two. Um, Sonoma County Transportation Authority, Regional Climate Protection Authority. Um, the uh, rollout of the um, Climate Action Plan for 2020 will probably be in the next uh, 60 to 90 days um, based on information that uh, has gone forward. Um, they have um, done a delay on the website for Regional Climate Protection Authority. Um, in the contracting, but um, that will be uh, resolved, and hopefully this will be an assist to all of the cities as well, so that um, the climate action plan as developed will be posted there, but with references and directions to all the different cities, so that um, there will be um, some following of information, and people will become more and more educated on what's being done in the uh, county on an environmental theme. Um, as a eight year entering into my eight year as a director um, in this um, organization and as the city of Sonoma and the purporter of getting us involved in regional climate uh, protection authority we were the first vote uh, we definitely um, want to go ahead and continue continue our leadership in that particular effort and there are many things that are coming forward in that area um, the a uh, program of interest, though, that uh, and Madeline was um, in attendance as well, was the discussion of the solid waste um, matrix. And um, the matrix is back. And uh, it'll be coming forward uh, to us with several conversations and decisions that we'll be making. So look forward to that for uh, next year. The second committee that I met on in... Um, I find this an absolutely fabulous and riveting position on the Marines, uh, the Marin Sonoma Mosquito and Vector Control District. Um, who who knew? All right, but um, they went ahead and they honored our Sonoma representative Charles Bowie again for his 30 years of service on this particular um, uh, board and um, the breadth of knowledge that he has is going to be hard to replace, but um, everyone is trying to step up to the plate. I think one of the most outstanding agreements that have been done is the association with Sonoma County Regional Parks Foundation. There are educational activities, um, and we received a report on it, and then we also went ahead and signed or approved an agreement for the Spring Lake Park Environmental Discovery Center. And if you have not been there or your children have not been there, this is a wonderful educational program. My last comment is to the community, and um, I'm looking for, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm most honored to be mayor, and I have felt the warmth of the community itself through the last two weeks 
going to this this event or that event and um, I see those in need in our community and while we all are going about our holidays and whatever I still think you know we all have a part of community volunteer in each and every one of us up here and we have supported in our past a lot of our partners of nonprofits here in the community and how important that is and for me although I can't always make that individual outreach and effort it's the fact that we do support them as partners so <laughs> I'm just making a request that if you find that you have any extra money any extra time any extra possibility of relating to other individuals who are not as fortunate in this community that you make the attempt and the outreach to connect with them for this is a very difficult season for some blessed for others and for me I wish that that for all that there would be a space where they can find joy in their life so with that we'll go ahead and go on to our City manager comments and announcements, including announcements from successor agency staff. Uh, just a just a quick announcement uh, that we are we have two um, we have vacancies on two commissions that I want to um, get the word out. We have the traffic safety committee has uh, two vacancies. One is a regular member position which may be an out of city of Sonoma or a Sonoma Valley resident. And the other vacancy is the alternate position, which must be a city resident. And the traffic safety committee meets on an as needed basis. And then we have a position open on our design review and historic preservation commission. Um, it is the alternate position and the commission meets the third Tuesday of each month at 630 and applicants must reside within the city limits. And applications will be accepted until uh, Wednesday, January 13th. Application forms are available at City Hall and on the website. And as we mentioned, the uh, first council meeting of January and January 4th has been canceled. And so the only January meeting will be on January 20th, which is a Wednesday. The 18th is a holiday, which would be our normal meeting, so we have moved that to the 20th. So just mark your calendars that it's a Wednesday, not a Monday. And with that, I uh, wish you all a very happy holiday. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We'll see you in 2016, and we appreciate all the support city staff does. City Hall will be open, closed half day on uh, Christmas Eve, and then reopen after Christmas Day. So happy holidays to all. Thank you very, very much. Now we'll go ahead and uh, I believe it's comments from the public, which is next. Anyone wishing to speak at this time? No one is wishing to speak. So before I adjourn the meeting, I just want to adjourn the meeting in honor of the public employees for the city of Sonoma. And what a fabulous job they have done <laughs> for all the residents of Sonoma. And a huge thank you, because without you, we would have no one to work with. <laughs> so, um, and a special thank you to you, Jeff, as our, as our attorney. And congratulations, Patrick Garcia, our 2016 Alcalde. We are adjourned. Happy New Year.